Welcome to Solution Spotlights with the CEA team at Griffin. Our Solution Spotlights are short, casual conversations where we bring our suppliers together with our in-house technical team to give you on-point solutions for everyday problems. Today, we are going to address aphid control with a focus on scouting and soft preventative control options. With us, we have Dr. Gretchen Pettis with BioSafe. We have Nick Bertoni with Bioline AgroSciences. And we have Erica Hernandez from our CEA team. We're going to get started with Todd Ruff, CEA sales rep serving customers in the mid-Atlantic states. Take it away, Todd. Thanks for the intro, Tammy. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Todd Ruff. I am the CEA rep for the Mid-Atlantic, and I'm really excited to be here today with this panel of experts to be able to discuss a really common problem that most CEA growers do face, and that is aphids. As with any problem, uh, the best way to control them is to understand them first, their life cycle and the effect that they have on plants. Uh, for that, I'm gonna kick it over to Erica Hernandez with our GGS Pro team. Erica, can you give us a brief overview of these annoying insects? Yeah, thanks Todd, thanks for that introduction. So let's jump right into some background information. Uh, aphids are soft bodied insects with piercing sucking mouth parts. So what that means is that they will colonize Plants, they will pierce plant material and consume the plant sap from inside the plant material, damaging the plant in the process. Now, by themselves and at low levels of um, populations, aphid damage is mostly cosmetic, but um, you know, there are a couple of important considerations here. Um, for one, aphids are um, potential vectors of a couple important plant viruses. So we always wanna keep that in mind. And then the byproducts of their uh, going through their life cycle can also promote some disease promoting conditions. So for example, as aphid populations get larger, they um, will tend to leave a couple of signs uh, behind as they go through their life cycle. Uh, one is growers will start to see a large number of cast skins. As aphids grow and develop, they will molt several times before they come to their adult stage, leaving behind these cast skins. Now, these can be uh, unsightly and messy, so you know that's not great, but it is also a good scouting indicator. The other thing that they tend to leave behind is a lot of sticky residue. As the aphids are feeding, they will produce a honeydew. They basically poop out sugar onto your plants. So that's, that's really not great. And when populations get larger, you start to see a large amount of this honeydew. And what this promotes is actually a, a pathogen called sooty mold. By itself, it doesn't necessarily hurt the plant a little bit here or there isn't necessarily a, a huge deal. But when we start to see a lot of honeydew, we will see a lot of sooty mold and this can really affect the health of our plants. Unfortunately, aphid populations can get out of control very quickly. What we will see with aphids is that when temperatures start to rise in the spring and the summer, um, or if you're in the greenhouse, you might have these conditions all year round. Um, typically between 68 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, we will start to see an explosion in aphid population. So one aphid in certain species can produce up to 12 offspring per day. Now that's a lot. And what we will also see is that each of those offspring as they're born, they're born ready to produce the next generation of aphids. They're basically born pregnant. It takes a couple days for them to get to the stage where they're able to actually start producing, but they're ready to go very quickly. We also have to worry about um, root aphids. This is a, a totally different um, control strategy, which some uh, I'll let our uh, our other experts here talk a little bit about that soon, but um, the problem with root aphids is they will actually colonize the entire container profile. Wherever there's roots uh, in your container, that's where you'll be finding the root aphids. Now this, this can be difficult because a lot of our control strategies with BCAs only get maybe the uh, the top or the outside of the container, whereas the root aphids will go all the way through. 
Foliar aphids are easy to find. Typically, you'll see the, the cast skins or the honeydew, and they're typically on tender uh, new growth underneath leaves, whereas the root aphids are a little bit more difficult to find since they're hidden within the container. Thank you, Erica. That's great. That's some great information. Uh, so now that we know a little bit about how they live and how they grow, um, we should probably talk about how um, to look for them, scouting techniques and some biological controls in order to identify them and work to control them. Uh, Nick, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Todd. So scouting, believe it or not, is like 75% of the work when having a successful IPM program, because, you know, as you said before, the best way to get around and, and get ahead of a pest is to know it. And part of knowing it is, is understanding its population dynamics, knowing where it is, when it is. Um, so scouting is most of the work and aphids often come in from, well, imported from other plants, depending on whether it's a liner or a finishing plant or, or even some cuttings, they're attracted to new plant growth since it's easiest for their mouthy parts to, to suck the phloem and the juices out of. So always be on the aware of, um, make sure to scout heaviest on the, the newest, uh, plant growth, um, there's always concern, especially for ornamental growers with this, because this, when they start to feed more and more and more, they start to have more than that threshold of, of uh, aesthetic damage. And with the ornamentals, the, the, the plant being the actual product, the threshold for damage is much lower. Early warning signs can include small local hot spots on new flowers, really focusing on the parient of the, of the below the parient of the flower. Um, and then also, just like Erica mentioned, looking out for those molts, those molts, the, the, the uh, left behind um, skins that, uh, that they leave when they, when they grow. So those are white, easy to see. They'll leave them, even though they hang around typically underneath the leaves, they'll leave them on the top of the leaves quite often. And that's an easy spot to, uh, to see them for telltale signs. So a lot of the best ways to control um, the aphid populations is the use of beneficial parasitic wasps. Now there's different species of them. Um, most common that most growers will know about is Aphidius colomani. Uh, there's also Aphidius ervi, as well as another lesser known one called Aphelinus abdominalis. Um, those are the top three uh, parasitoids that are best used. What's, in, what's most important to note about them is knowing which one to pick. So like they are, they are generalists, but each of them have their own niche. So the, it's not a rule, it's not an absolute rule, but the typical trend is that the Colomani wasps tend to go after the smaller aphids. So your pea aphid, your melon aphid, your green peach aphid, that sort of thing. Whereas the Irvi would tend to go for the larger ones. So that would could include potato aphids, foxglove aphids, cannabis aphids, that sort of thing. So that's really important to know. The Aphelinus abdominalis has a little bit of a wider range, still leaning a little bit more towards the larger aphids, but they are very important. Now, one thing that's really important to note is how they work. So the way that they work is they will mate and then the females will find the right aphids to, to infect and they will literally inject, they'll, pest, they'll pester them to figure out which ones are best. They'll harass them and then they'll find the best ones and they'll inject their egg directly into the aphid. And then the whole life cycle from larvae all the way to adult occurs within the aphid. And then throughout this, this cycle, the aphid will slowly die. And then once it dies, it bloats and becomes what we know to be the mummy. And that's just the leftover shell of the aphid that, hope, that held, holds the, the growing uh, parasitoid until it's ready to hatch, in which case it would hatch out the backside. And when scouting, you would be able to see the exit hole on the back end of the aphid. So what's important to note is that it takes a few weeks, but releasing them consistently, you'll start to see this more and more control. And for growers that don't necessarily know the aphids that they're dealing with, the species or species plural that they're dealing with, one, tar one application style that is very popular is using a mixture. Using a mixture of the beneficials of the parasitic wasps, because each of them produces kind of a different colored mummy. So the Colomani will produce more of a gold colored mummy, the Irby kind of sandy closer to that white shade. And then the Aphelinus abdominalis is very easy to understand. It, it turns the aphid black. So it's really easy to see. So when growers would typically release either two or all three for a period of weeks, and then they'll start to see the mummy, like the mummification of, of the aphids. And based on the color or colors, 
that the growers are seeing in those mummies, they can determine which parasitic wasps are working the most. And from that understanding, you can back calculate to see which range or ranges of aphids you're most likely dealing with. That's great. Once a grower makes a decision what's best for their grow, can you give us some best practices for releasing the beneficials? Absolutely. So what's going to be important is understanding where the populations are or are expected to be and understanding the dynamic of scouting as well as releasing. So one of the most important things is to make sure if using chemistries to you to release the bios and calculate when to release the bios, not only after the chemistries have been used, but after the residual factor has passed to make sure that you're minimizing absolute as many risks as possible to the beneficials to give them the best chance to establish and to do the most work that they can do. On top of that, when I say scouting, I mean scouting for everything. So one of the things that a lot of growers uh, may overlook sometimes when they hear scouting, they're looking for the pest. But also what's just as important is scouting for the beneficials. Because if you understand the population dynamic of both, you can further understand the interactions that are happening between the two of them. So you can check those fluctuation dynamics as well as releasing as evenly and consistently as possible. Those, those um, techniques will really help improve and maximize the efficacy of the program itself. Thanks, Nick. That's some great information. That's one control strategy down, but beneficial ins uh, insects aren't our only option. Insecticidal fungi sprays can also help out when our beneficial insects can't get to all the hiding spaces of all these little pests. So how do the insecticidal fungi work? Uh, what species do we prefer? So just like people, insects can get diseases and fungal infections as well. You know, at its most basic, the application of insecticidal fungi involves spraying microscopic spores called conidia onto the infested plants and onto the insects themselves whenever possible. So when the conidia or these spores of the fungus come into contact with the body of the insect host, they'll germinate, penetrate that outer exoskeleton of the insect or the cuticle of that pest. And then the fungus will develop inside the insect's body, eventually killing the insect after a few days. And there's several different fungi that can be effective as biological control agents. Some that um, many here may have heard of uh, that you might be familiar with are Metarhizium species, Isaria species, and Bovaria bassiana, such as in Biosafe Systems uh, BioSeries WP. Now, many growers pair azadiractin with insecticidal fungi applications. Why do they do that? That's actually a really great question. And research, multiple research studies have shown that when you combine something like Bavaria bassiana and azadiractin, these natural biorational products, they can have synergistic effects. That means applying them together provides more benefit than applying either one of them individually. And azadiractin, since it's an insect growth regulator, targets really just the nymphs and the larvae. So the immature stages of whatever pest you're dealing with. In this case, it would be a nymph for aphids. Um, whereas Bovaria targets all the life stages. What situations are best for using this type of a control strategy? Generally, azadiractin and intimum pathogenic fungi such as Bavaria are recommended as part of a proactive IPM strategy. So neither azadiractin or Bavaria are, are what we would call a knockdown agent. And both products generally are going to take several days to kill a pest. So if we think about an aphid that can double its population every 1.8 days or something at 73 to 76 degrees, you can imagine that you would want to, to take care of them as early as possible. But something for like root aphids that Erica talked about, um, this we've seen a really good success combining azadiractin with Bavaria. And there's a natural, uh, naturally derived surfactant in our azadiractin formula that can help move that product down through the soil profile. And that can be helpful to reach all of those aphids that are in that media. That's great information, Gretchen. I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you, everybody. This has been some really great information. Uh, for any of our customers, if you guys are facing a sudden explosion of aphids or you just simply want to know more about what you heard today, 
please let us know. Don't hesitate to reach out to your local Griffin rep or feel free to give us a call at 1-800-888-0054, extension 89199. Again, that number, 800-888-0054, extension 89199. Or you can email us at cea at griffinmail.com. That's cea at griffinmail.com. Thanks again to Erica, Nick, and Gretchen, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks a lot.